Hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're so excited to have you be here with us. Now, I know you're here for Sarah, so you may be wondering, who's this guy? <laughs> uh, my name's Aaron. I am the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Southern Illinois, Southeast Missouri, and Western Kentucky. It's a long name. Uh, and I'm also the director at Camp Ben Frankel. And we're the organization that is uh, running the event tonight. And um, anyway, so I wanted to say welcome and uh, tell you a little bit, a little bit more before we, uh, we turn to Sarah, say a little bit more about our organization and what's going on. So bear with me as I do a little Zoom screen share and make that happen. This is the kickoff of our 2023 virtual event series. Uh, virtual events are something that we got started with really a lot a few years ago in the midst of COVID. We launched an online summer camp the summer of 2020. We ran eight weeks of online camp. And we also had a whole series of online events where we had celebrities in sports, in the media, Hollywood, and uh, Broadway and more. Um, and uh, more, I think most importantly, we connected with kids across the country and across the globe uh, and built an online community in the depths of some pretty, I think, rough times for all of us. And uh, it ended up being an incredible silver lining that we grew Camp Ben Frankel's community uh, across the globe. And uh, the magic happened. If, a couple years later when we were returning to our in-person camp and we got to meet a lot of the kids and staff who had joined us for the first time online and we got to meet them in person. And, uh, and that's a little bit of our story for our camp. These virtual events uh, have been awesome for us. And so tonight's Passover cooking demonstration matzo balls with Sarah Bradley is uh, the first in a new series of online events. Uh, let me tell you real quick about what's happening next month. Our next month's event is gonna be a little bit different, but it's going to be a panel discussion hosted by another camp alum. His name is Peter Mayer. He's a veteran broadcast journalist who covered the White House for CBS News uh, for several decades. And Peter's gonna be hosting a panel discussion about talking to our kids about pride in being Jewish in the face of rising anti-Semitism. And we have some pretty great speakers who are gonna be on that panel and we've got more coming. And we'd love you to join us for that one as well. And, uh, and then uh, stay tuned because we'll be announcing our May event soon thereafter. But tonight's not about that. Tonight's about Chef Sarah Bradley. And you may or may not know that Sarah is from Paducah, Kentucky. We'll talk more about why that's relevant in a little bit. Sarah is the chef and proprietor of Freight House. It's her restaurant. Freight House is located in Paducah, Kentucky. Sarah was a contestant on Top Chef Kentucky, season 16 of Top Chef. And that was just a few years ago. And in that season, Sarah won a competition with matzo ball soup. And uh, that was episode 14, by the way, if you're keeping score. And, uh, and so that got her some nice notoriety and, um, and also just helped to kind of spread the word on matzo ball soup, man. <laughs> right now, Sarah is a contestant on season 20 of Top Chef World All-Stars. How cool is that? You can see Sarah competing every Thursday night on Bravo. So tune in tomorrow check your local listings. Um, what's pretty cool is if you've already watched episodes one and two have aired already have aired already and on episode one right out of the gate Sarah won the very first quick fire challenge. Again, how cool is that? Now I can wait, you may or may not know Sarah's an alum of Camp Ben Frankel. Um, is anybody here interested in seeing a photo of Sarah when she was a camper at camp? I mean, I'm assuming the response is yes. I can't see any of you. Um, so let's look at the next slide, shall we? There's Sarah. You can tell because there's a yellow arrow pointing to her. Um, and uh, 
And that's a, and it looks much older than it is because that photo is in black and white, but this was the 90s, I promise. We actually had color film at that time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Sarah, I, I think I see that we've got a, at least a couple other people from that photo here with us tonight. And I know that we've also pictured in that photo, we've got others who now send their kids to camp or volunteer with Camp and Franco in other important ways. Um, we're so excited uh, that Sarah's chosen to come support Camp and Franco tonight. Uh, it's, uh, it's really special, it's really an honor. Um, now, Sarah first came to camp in the 90s with her brother, Joe, and her sister, Ellen. Um, and as mentioned, Sarah is from Paducah, Kentucky, which is a small town. It's about an hour from camp. Our camp is located in Southern Illinois. Uh, it's about a, it's a couple hours from St. Louis. It's, a, it's a, about a half day's drive from Chicago, for example. And let's talk a little bit about why small towns are connected to camp. Well, the camp was founded almost 75 years ago, and it was created to serve kids from small Jewish communities. That was part of the original intent of Camp Ben Frankel. Uh, today, Camp Ben Frankel takes the spirit of that idea and has just kind of expanded on it to serve kids from who are underserved otherwise, kids who need a Jewish place, kids who are looking for a welcoming warm Jewish family. And so that might look like kids from a small town like Paducah, small Jewish community anyway, or it might look like kids from maybe an interfaith family, or maybe kids with a disability or a special need, or with an LGBTQ plus background, or lots of other reasons that a kid might feel like they are not connected to a Jewish community and in need of one. What's pretty cool is in this picture on the left, there's a picture of David in the green shirt uh, with a hat on. David's mom was in that photo with Sarah. Uh, they were in the cabin together. And then on the right, also with a hat, is Nora. Nora's also from Kentucky, and she first heard about camp when she was eating at Freight House Restaurant. Uh, we're a small Jewish community. We're a small camp. We're, uh, we're a small family, and uh, it's great to stay connected. Um, just a couple other things to know. Uh, we're pretty proud about this. Um, this last summer, our parents voted uh, or rated us the number one Jewish camp in North America, according to parent satisfaction. Um, so that's not too shabby. Uh, in fact, um, we, those ratings uh, scaled across a lot of different categories, including um, the ones that you see pictured here. And somewhat surprising to us, that included things like sports activities. And we do love sports at camp, and we do a lot of sports at camp, but I was a little surprised to see us rated <laughs> number one in sports satisfaction. Um, but also included one of our, some of our uh, creative arts programs, which includes culinary arts and cooking. Um, so maybe that's relevant, maybe not. You be the judge. Anyway, um, that's my way of saying that if you're maybe, if you know someone who might be interested in camp or maybe you've got a camp potential camper, uh, if you send them to Camp and Frankel, they will go and end up on Top Chef. I promise it will definitely happen. It might be, you know, 10, 20 years, but... This is the pathway, folks. Uh, <laughs> um, or at least they can be on a camp program called Top Chef. That's maybe more likely. Who knows? Uh, anyway, enough about that. Um, let me stop the share. Because what you're here for and what's more important is that we're going to soon hand this over to Sarah Bradley, the Top Chef herself. Tonight, Sarah's going to demonstrate her matzo ball recipe. Uh, you'll see that demonstration. We'll put a couple of the, her cameras up so that you can see them. There we go. We've got one. Um, and it'll, so it'll be easy to, to view and monitor. At the end, we're going to have time for a Q&A. So you can pop questions in the chat. We'll have the chat open. A couple things to note is if you do have questions, what's uh, totally okay is any questions related to Top Chef for anything that is already aired on TV. So if it happened and it's been televised, that's fair game. However, questions about something that's not yet been aired or televised, that's all out of bounds. So we won't be relaying any of those questions. Just keep that in mind. Anyway, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, you might be interested in the recipe for uh, from Sarah's matzo balls tonight. We will email those tomorrow uh, to everyone who attended tonight. Anyway, 
That said, we're overjoyed to welcome Sarah. So welcome, Sarah Bradley. We're so excited to have you. We can turn my camera off and go over to Sarah from here. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, you guys, show me some Ruach. Um, so I just want to start by saying we're going to jump into one thing really quick. I was going to give a little intro, but I don't think I need one because Aaron's was so beautiful. Um, you will hear them sometimes refer to me as Bradley because there were so many Sarahs in my cabin. We all went by our last name. It was a very popular name amongst girls my age. Um, so I want to start really quick um, just by letting you know that the most important part of making a matzo ball, it's not the stock, it's not the bra. It's, I mean, that is very important. It's the technique in making the matzo ball. So I'm going to do that first. And I've already got some pots going back here. Um, also, we are in the beautiful Temple Israel, which is, there is a thriving active temple in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, we are in their kitchen tonight. So let's get right into making the matzo balls because one of the things about matzo balls I like to think is like unleavened bread. What we've got like eight minutes to cook it. It has to happen very fast. That is what I think is the most, one of the most important parts of making a matzo ball. So number one, making it happen quickly. Number two, not compressing it too hard. And number three, um, the, what the stock or the broth looks like when you drop it in. So um, let's get with the first thing. Okay, so you can see up here, I kind of have like a little prep can on here. So in this right here, I have two cups of matzo meal. You can either buy matzo meal or you could just grind up matzo. I think it's a really good way to use the matzo that you didn't eat or when the matzo goes on sale at Kroger, you buy the stuff that wasn't eaten and you grind it up for next year. So I've got in here two cups of matzo. Um, I'm gonna add a bunch of coarse ground black pepper. And one of the great things about this is you guys, I don't ever buy pre-ground pepper. I always buy like whole peppercorns, put them in a grinder. And just by turning this knob on the top, if you loosen it, you're gonna get like really coarse ground black pepper. If you tighten it, you're gonna get a really fine pepper. And I like the coarse ground pepper. So I want about, oh, a half a teaspoon, a teaspoon of that. And it always has so much more flavor. And I usually toast the peppercorns before I put them in the grinder. Um, the next thing we're going to add is a little bit of ground fennel seed and toast the fennel seed. And then um, it's probably my favorite of all the flavors. I know it's controversial, but it's like that licorice, anise, um, flavor. I just think that it works so beautifully with all foods. And I think it especially works really well with matzo balls because we're going to have porosis with it. So it's going to have like walnuts, apples, red wine. This is going to be perfect. So I'm going to add about a teaspoon of that in there. Then what I would call the most um, Jewish of all the herbs, dill. <laughs> I think that like what I think, I don't know, maybe it's manna. Um, but I'm going to go with it's dill. So I do about two tablespoons of chopped dill, fresh dill. Um, you guys use fresh herbs if you can. Two tablespoons of chopped dill in there. That's it. Oh, and a big pinch of salt. Put a pinch of salt in there. So maybe a couple teaspoons, tablespoon. Go ahead and mix that up. You want to go ahead and mix the dry together to make sure that the baking powder is all incorporated throughout. Okay, next we're gonna do um, six whole eggs. And if you read the back of the matzo ball, like if you get the manager of it's matzo meal already made, this is not the same recipe on the back. I like a little more egg in mine um, and I like a little more baking powder. I think it just becomes more fluffy. Go ahead and give those a little whisk. We're gonna add, I did not have schmaltz. I had pork lard, the fresh homemade lard at the restaurant, but I didn't have any schmaltz. So I just brought a little vegetable. I didn't wanna bring lard into the temple. I was trying to be a good um, reform view. So we're gonna add our oil, get this a mix. And this, you guys, is the most important part of making matzo balls. I have my dry mix, I have my wet mix. I have soda water. I learned this trick from my mother. I guess all other people know this, but I did not know this. 
So I don't want it to have some like nice bubbles in it. So if you just lightly mix that in and don't break all the bubbles, you'll get a fluffier um, matzo ball. So I'm just gonna add the wet in here, do the dry. And I'm just gonna start to stir it. You are not going to over mix. Do not over mix here. I just start to go until it looks like it's maybe half to a, two thirds of the way incorporated. And that's when I start to add my soda water. So I'm gonna go with maybe, oh, a couple ounces to start. Stir that in very gently. And I can still see, if you can, I can still see there's like some dry parts to that. So you kind of down on the bottom. So we need a little bit more. But one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to overhydrate here. And I've heard people be like, oh, I make my matzo balls and then let them sit in the fridge, you know, for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, in my uh, professional top chef opinion, plenty of salt, perfect. Um, that's the worst thing you can do for a matzo ball. We want these matzo balls to hydrate in like our beautiful stock. We don't want the matzo to hydrate because of the soda water or the egg um, or just sitting around. I feel like if you let them sit around, they will get really, really dense. So very quick. The other thing is um, we use baking powder. So baking powder is a leavener. It is um, activated by heat and by acid. There's no acid in this dish but their heat is gonna be when we drop them in the water. So I just like to keep them either room temperature or cold. Don't put them over next to the stove, let them just hang out. They only need about eight, 10 minutes to sit around. Um, next, really quick, I'm just gonna show you, I've kind of already done some of this um, in my pot because I just wanted to be ready. But this is how I like to cut onions for matzo ball soup. I like to leave the little like root attached. So, they're nice together. Um, I usually cut them in big chunks. I also love to put, I know it's not traditional, you guys, but I love to put mushrooms in my matzo ball soup. These are shiitake mushrooms. I love them in my soup. Um, I also do celery. I just cut it pretty, like, it's not, you know, it's nothing crazy, just like little chunks. Um, and then I do carrots. I just, Peeled carrots, I do them in little rounds like this. This is not the same veg that I used to cook the chicken in. I do save those veg, I don't just throw them away. Um, but I like for the garnish, I like to be like kind of perfectly cut vegetables. I also cannot not eat celery, I love celery. Um, so this stock that I'm adding these vegetables to right now, this simmered with the whole chicken. So I put a whole chicken in there. I covered it in stock that we have in the restaurant, like chicken stock. I think box chicken stock is a great way. I'm also not opposed to like the bouillon stuff that you buy in the jar. Um, I add that. I do a little bit of star anise in my stock. Again, fennel flavor, licorice flavor. I do it because it reminds me of the star, David. So I think it, it makes it feel like you're doing. Um, and then I do fresh herbs. So if you're wondering about how to store herbs when you get them home from the grocery, if they're soft herbs like this, so in here I have, um, I have fresh dill and I have sage. Um, I put a little sage and thyme and rosemary in the pot. If you're doing fresh herbs, I like to store them rolled up and just, just maybe barely damp paper towel. If they are hard herbs, so things like rosemary, um, tarragon, um, time, things that are a little more hearty. I don't store those wraps. I just store those where they are. I put them all in a quart container, keep them sealed. These will stay good in your fridge for weeks. This is the way we do it at the restaurant. Um, take them out of those little plastic things you get at the store and put them in one of these. It's great. So um, cook my chicken in the stock. Once it was done, I let the stock completely cool with the whole chicken in it. That is something that's super important for making a really moist chicken. Let that chicken cool and kind of reabsorb all of its juices. And then once it's cool enough, you can take it and um, pick it apart. So um, yeah, I've got a few more minutes on my matzo balls. Aaron, you got any questions coming in yet? I sure do. Uh, one, of, one of the questions here is, uh, can you tell me a little bit 
about how you like where did these matzo ball recipes come from did, is everything from uh you know how much is from mom's suggestions like the soda water for example well i mean so growing up i we ate matzo ball in our household we didn't just eat it on passover like it really was a celebration food it was a feel good food it was a quick dinner food. Um, matzo ball can be done like right out of the box with the premix and everything very quickly. Um, but for me, matzo balls were like, they they don't they don't scream Passover. Like I make matzo balls for my children and family all the time. It's as common as like tomato soup and grilled cheese in my house. Um, I think that I learned from lots of trial and error from my mother actually like putting my hands in the bowl and helping, letting me help make matzo balls. Um, and by reading the back of the Vinashevitz box, <laughs> you know, like there's nothing wrong in like reading a recipe that's already there and then just kind of tweaking it by adding fresh herbs and adding spices and adding things like that. Um, but yeah, but you guys, this is it. This is it on the matzo balls. We don't need them to sit around much longer. They are good to go. Um, one thing that I am going to do before I start rolling them, I always have to check my stuff. And that stop needs to be moving. And when I say moving, I'm going to bring it over so you guys can see it a little bit better. I have a burner underneath here. It needs to be bubbling. You need that motion of that stock to like keep all the matzo balls from just floating to the bottom and sticking together. If it's not moving around, then, um, Oh, somebody, I saw a question pop up. It says, if you're looking for baking soda for Passover, it's really interesting because I think it's about the production of how the baking soda is used. Surprisingly, baking soda or baking powder is not considered a leavener when it's like for Passover. Like, I don't know how we get away with it, but as I've been told, you can use baking soda and baking powder for Passover. Um, it's like a different type of leavening. It's not done because of time, it's like a chemical leavener. So somebody, if somebody knows better than me or I am wrong, please correct me. But, okay, so matzo ball, about the size of a golf ball, right? The trick to this is you guys, do not take your matzo ball and like roll it. Don't, like you can see here, okay. Don't push your matzo ball. You are literally pushing all of the air out of it. All of, I'm not even gonna put this one in there. All of the air out of it, all of the stuff that's fluffy, what you want is to just barely roll your matzo ball like this. You can see there's still some little cracks on the sides. It doesn't need to be perfect and that's okay. Um, I usually make them about the size of a golf ball. I might make these a little bigger just because, but again, I am not over rolling. And I actually see a little bit of dry parts in here and that's okay because it's kind of like when you're making waffles or pancakes and you want them, it's okay to have a little bit of lump. They're going to continue to hydrate and we're going to put them in a pot of liquid. So if there's some dry stuff in here, it's going to suck up flavor and it's going to suck up that liquid and it's going to be delicious. So we're going to roll them. I'm making them a little bigger than golf balls right now. I will be making the matzo balls for the um, Passover dinner at Temple of Israel this year, along with um, my mother's brisket and her chopped liver. So good. So good. Aaron, you got anything else coming in while I'm just rolling these guys up? Yeah, we've got a um a question from Mindy asks, when cool, you take chicken out of the stock and pull off bone, but when you put balls in stock, is the chicken in there? It's not in there yet. No, it's already cooked. So your chicken is cooked. So I I have it just kind of sitting behind me. Um if you want to cook it like the day before, what I would do is store it in a little bit of the stock. Still wait till um, you know, still wait until it um, cools off, and then pick it and store it in some of the stock so that it stays really moist. And I'm going to tell you guys, these matzo balls start to stick to my hands. Some people I've seen will do like a little bit of oil. I just like a little bit of water to get your hands wet and they come and it's right back off. And again, we're not over rolling these. Yeah, so the chicken comes out, it just hangs out. I like to cook the vegetables and so we're fortifying again. 
But in my mind, the chicken's already cooked, so I don't need to cook it again, just put it in there. Um, so we are not over rolling these, super important. I've actually had people say that they prefer, um, you know, there's the whole controversy, do you like sinkers or floaters? I like floaters, my matzo balls, I want them to float, but I've heard that some people do like sinkers. Well, that's uh, pretty topical because one of the questions is how would you change your recipe if you like the matzo balls hard? Oh, if you like the matzo balls hard. Okay, so what you could do is take some of the egg whites out. So super easy. Also, if you hydrate them, if you let them sit around a little bit longer, they will be a little bit firmer. But if you take out some of the egg whites and replace that with an egg yolk, like an egg white, um, like you can picture cooking in the pan, you know, you scramble eggs and it puffs. Um, egg yolks seem to are more setting and they set around like 135 degrees. So as soon as they hit that boiling water, it's going to start. So that's why you need that baking powder to puff it. So I would just take out a little of the egg white and add a little more egg yolk. Now we're good. After that. All right. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay. Got my old crusty burner here. If you can see inside this pot, everything is moving. Like there is actual rapid movement. These matzo balls are like room temperature or they are cold. So when we drop them into this hot sock, it's going to be like we put ice cold bricks in there. So we're going to drop these, start dropping these in, and you'll see. that immediately you're going to start floating. And if you don't have enough movement in the stock, whenever you put them in, they're gonna go right to the bottom. Um, you can always turn this down, but you need to have it really moving around. And like, it can actually be at a rapid boil if you wanna drop a whole bunch of them. And then when you drop them, um, it's gonna cool it off, but it's all still moving around. And I also don't ever put more matzo balls in than will fill the whole top layer. Like I don't want some to cook underneath and some to cook on top. So if you have a plate that's about the size when you make the matzo balls, they need a little extra room because they're going to expand. This is a trick for you guys. I'm going to move our matzo balls here. You guys can watch them cook. So this is a little piece of parchment paper. So you guys, this is um, chef trick number one. I can tell you, I get a fresh pot, I get a pot and I just get rid of the lid. I can't stand them, they're in the way, it's driving crazy. So we're gonna take our rectangle here, and fold it like this. And this is called a cartouche. This is just a French term for, so you can see here, now I folded it, now I'm gonna fold it back. So it ends up looking like a little house. So if you see again, I've got the whole piece, fold one corner away, one corner away, and then you've got this little house. All you need to do is just keep this point and keep folding over. And I actually have a video on the internet that shows you how to do this and you keep folding over. You keep folding over. And I'm gonna find the halfway mark of my pot here. And I'm just gonna give this a little tear. Maybe, I need my mouth. Not very strong, I guess. And I'm gonna give a little tear in the middle. And what I end up with, it's a perfect circular lid that I will put on top of here. You need to cook your matzo balls covered, super important. There's also a hole in the middle. That's the reason I like that better than um, like a still lid. So what it does, I can turn my heat down a little bit. There's still a space for some of the steam and some of the heat to escape, but it's keeping the moisture right down on top of the matzo ball. And so you're not gonna get any like where they're dried out or they're not, but for me, this, is like the only way I'll ever cook beans. I don't put a lid on, I put these on. Um, this is like a perfect way to braise meat. You put that right down on top of it and you're gonna get um, perfectly, like perfect meat every time. It's called a cartouche. So um, I do have a video on how to make those. This is my trick. So we talked about 
making them aquaballs quickly, rolling them gently, and putting them in stock that is not gentle at all. Those are your three most important things about making the moxa balls. And then when you're done, and I've got some that are totally finished. The other thing is when you see these that are done, they cook about 15 minutes, depending on how big they are. Um, don't just take them out of the pot. Chill out and relax. Maybe drink a glass of, um, you know, Logan David or Manischewitz and um, let the matzo balls stick. Let them stay and rest in the broth for a good 15 minutes. Turned off, just rest. That's when you can add your chicken back in, your veggies will be cooked. You can adjust seasoning if you need to. But what that does and what makes that so beautiful is here in a second, I'm gonna pull one out and cut it open and let you guys see what the inside looks like. So this initial thing is to puff it and make it big. And then while we're simmering it, we're kind of setting all those albumin and all that yolk and everything from the egg. When we let it sit, that is whenever it's just like the chicken, it's gonna absorb all those juices. That's what makes a really kind of soft, delicate matzo ball. So you have to give it a little rest. Um, I wish you guys could eat these with me. I'm going to, eat, I'm going to eat them, but I do know that we, um, I can see lots of questions coming in. So if you, you want to give me a few of them. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I can tell that you are blowing people away with a cartouche suggestion <laughs> for starters. Um, so we've got a, a fair number of questions, uh, that we've built up here. Something, and, and I'll, we'll get to those in just a second. Um, something that you and I were talking about a little bit, just kind of off the cuff, was uh, just kind of what it was like for you as someone who identifies really proudly Jewish. You know, as coming from a small Jewish community in the South I mean, and going to a Jewish camp like Camp and Frankel, how did that in any way like influence or shape where you are today? You know, I think that um, growing up in like in Paducah, where there aren't a lot of Jewish kids uh, my age, you don't really have any peers, um, you know, and there were a couple options for me. There was feel like I was different and maybe like I was an outsider. And I think that what camp taught me to do was to embrace being different and know that even though I'm not around a bunch of Jewish people every day, like maybe if you live in a big city, um, but there's still, it still is my identity. And I knew, I looked forward to those three weeks every summer where I spent, um, you know, hanging out with my friends. I mean, I really do. I have told people, you know, like how important camp is to me. I really think that it gave me a sense of my Jewish identity. Um, because I didn't have, I, I mean, I had that here, you know, we have a temple, we have a synagogue, but I didn't have people to just like be a kid and be Jewish with them and for it to, you weren't different. You were like everyone else. When you go to summer camp, you are like everyone else and you are there for the exact same reason and that is to have a good time and make friends. And I just, you know, I, I really credit Camp and Frankel to, to a lot of, I mean, I credit it to some of my best friends that in my entire life and some of my best friends that have been like big impacts in my culinary career. Um, you know, I don't know if the lights are on here, but um, I wouldn't have had somewhere to live in Chicago if it wasn't for my best friend from summer camp. And she was my roommate the entire time I was in Chicago. So it's, it's just been a huge part of my life. Thanks for indulging me. I need to also indulge masa ball specific questions. For example, <laughs> <laughs> um, Julia asked, uh, I struggle with my masa balls falling apart after cooking any recommendations. So um, a couple things. I also, like I've said, I think that some of the recipes don't add enough egg. The egg is really the binder. And I think that chefs, um, that the reason we love eggs is because we kind of understand that while they're a binder, they also, they also act as a leavener. I mean, when they cook, they puff. Like, you ever want an example? Take your kids, put an egg in a plastic container like this scramble one egg, put it in a plastic container like this and go put it in the microwave. That egg will go from being this tall to sticking out of the container this big. So I always think that not following the recipe that you're given like on the back of the box and adding a few more eggs is the way 
to make everything really hold together. So I'm doing six cups, or I'm doing, I'm sorry, I'm doing two cups to six eggs. And I think that they say do a half a cup to one egg is what they say. Um, or that may be the uh, food is one of those boxes. So I always add a few more eggs. I think that that is really helpful. Um, also, if you let them overhydrate in the bowl, I think that they kind of like, they become what they want. They are the shape that they want to become and then they're stuck. And when you try to manipulate them and roll them, they're not happy about it. So when you drop them in, they're not happy and they want to fall apart. Um, that's some of the, some of the things I would say. Yeah. Okay. I want to show you guys one of these really quick. So these, this matzo ball started out um, probably about half this size. And here's where we are now, just a few minutes into cooking. I want to cut it open though, so you guys can see what the inside looks like. It feels super firm right now. I'm going to try to get this up so you guys can see it. If you can see on the inside of the grape, see this part that looks like a different color than the outside? That's where the matzo ball, I mean, I can pull the middle out. It's like totally raw. It has not cooked yet, but you can see the outside is firm. Like when I try to flake it off, it doesn't want to flake. That's the part that needs to sit and rehydrate, um, be happy, be lucky and love. Let me see if I can find a little one too. Okay, so this one, the little one, it is no longer raw, but what it is, is dense. It's hard because everything is cooked. So I'm like, ouch, hot. I'm pulling on it and it doesn't like, look at it. It does not want to bounce back. Let me show you guys the ones that rested in the raw. So that one here that rests in the broth, when I cut through it, it goes through like butter. And let me show you the difference, if you can see it. So this is the one that hasn't rested. This is the one that has. It's the same consistency all the way through. And this one has not rested. Look what happens when I squeeze it. Nothing. Look what happens when I squeeze this one. It's full. It's full of the stuff. Like that is what you want. Do not serve your matzo balls right away. I actually think that it's like totally okay for them to hang out for an hour or two. Um, you just have to be careful when you reheat them. But um, I actually prefer matzo balls like on day number two. They're so delicate. They're so soft. Um, they're so full of flavor. They're almost more like a bread dumpling, which I guess is what matzo balls are. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, uh, fellow CBF alum Adam asks, do you have an, a vegetarian alternative for the stock? Yeah, I mean, so uh, we served, the last time that we served it at the freight house, we served a vegetarian. Um, what I think for when you're making a vegetarian stock is one thing that I love to do is if you have like a meat grinder or a food processor, take a whole bunch of your vegetables and put them in there. Um, fennel, carrot, onion, parsnip, shallot, garlic, mushrooms, especially dried mushrooms, grind them all up like in your food processor and then simmer your stock with them. You then will have to strain that off and discard them because they'll just be mush. But now you've made this really fortified, beautiful stock. I would put in there like peppercorns and fennel seed and coriander seed. Um, black garlic is always super yummy in stocks. It gives like a very umami flavor. Um, and then I would just do the recipe the same way. You don't have to change nothing about it is um, not vegetarian. You can use vegetable oil like I did instead of chicken schmaltz and you would the exact same production. Um, I also, what I did on Top Chef in China, in China and Top Chef was um, I did use a little bit of chicken bones in the broth, but it was almost all vegetables. And, um, you know, I was going to put some chicken in the, in the bowl, but when I got it cooked, I didn't like it, so I didn't serve it, which was a good thing. Um, so I think that matzo ball soup is actually an excellent, excellent vegetarian option because you put all those eggs in there, so there's all that protein. 
Um, yeah, and they're really good with like a soft boiled egg right in it and crack it open. So good, so good. Can you guys see that? So it's still, I've still got movement in here. It's still bubbling around. And when you put that lid on there, it really starts, like it really starts to bubble up more. But these guys are pretty close to being done. Um, they're pretty huge. So I would turn it off and let them hang out. And that would be it. Easy months of all. Anybody else? Oh yeah, we got more questions here. Um, is there a way to prepare the matzo balls a day in advance and reheat the next day without compromising the quality? Yes. So the way I would do that, let me see. I would use something like this to store them. So I would poach them, I would let them rest, I would let them, um, you know, chill out, hang out, rest, and then I would gently transfer them into a bowl like this so they're not all or like a pan, so they're not all on top of each other. I would add some of the stock to make sure they stay nice and hydrated. I would wrap this with foil, and like, or I'm sorry, wrap this with plastic really tight, just like the top part of it, so just plastic all the way around here. And then what I would do is I would, the next day I would take this out, I would let it come to kind of room temperature, I would wrap it in foil with the plastic still on, and I would put this in the oven. It's going to heat it without the movement of like the water or the stock moving around. So then you heat up that other stock that you've made. Your matzo balls are into some stock in here. Not, it doesn't even have to be completely full, maybe like a third of the way full. You wrapped it tight with plastic so that none of that moisture escapes. And then you've covered it with foil. The plastic won't, I think it's, I know it sounds crazy, but the plastic won't melt. Um, especially like if you use like saran wrap or something, it won't melt. Um, and then when you're done and these are good and warm, you just take that off, you spoon that into the bowl, you put some of the hot broth over it, no one will ever know the difference. All right, what else you got? Okay, I think this is a cartouche question, <laughs> um, which is, have you ever used that technique for something that requires a long braise in an oven, like like a cholent or something similar? Hold on, I'm gonna make you guys watch me eat balls. Um, yeah, so we do that technique for a lot of things. Like if we want to, um, like sometimes if you wanna braise something, say like lamb shank or brisket, and you wanna get some color like on the top of it, um, a cartouche is a good way to make sure that not too much of the, you know, nothing really evaporates, but a little bit of it stays out. And then you can always take that off like halfway through cooking, but you would do a cartouche and then you would have to wrap it in foil if you were going to braise it. Um, but if you want your meat to get like really caramelized, then you're not, the cartouche is not what you want. Um, but I use that a lot in like when you do like the big um, cast iron cooking or like the big, um, enamel cast iron that's a really good way to make sure everything stays like super tight and no like it's an extra protection that your moisture doesn't come out so yeah the cartridge is like i mean it's it's not something i invented it was something i learned maybe even before culinary. no i probably learned it in culinary school but it's something that people, it's one of the first things that cooks learn when they come to my restaurant um how to make cartridge and how to zest a lemon <laughs> matzo balls are one of the things that I have no self-control over I gotta get sit down and eat like 10 matzo balls I won't do that on here though I won't make you guys watch me eat 10 matzo balls well and a kind of loosely related question if you're let's say you've got so many that you just can't wait to eat tomorrow and you, you are going to reheat them, what temperature would you set the oven for when you're doing that reheating? I would do like 300. So the thing about 350 degrees is that um, sugars really start to caramelize at 350 degrees. 
Um, if you think about like slow cooking, so water starts to boil and evaporate at 212. So when you bake a cake or something with leavener, when it hits that 212 degrees, it's the water starts to turn into steam. And then that is another additional leavener in um, instead of baking soda or baking powder or eggs. Um, even butter can be considered a leavener because butter is 100% fat. It's also, um, it's also got some milk solids in there. So that butter, you know, it, it starts to, it hits that steaming point, 212, starts to leaven. And then all of the sugars that are in there, those don't really start to caramelize until about 350 degrees. And you would notice that like on a candy thermometer or something. So that's why 350 is a pretty good temperature for stuff because you're going to get some caramelization. So if you go lower than that, you're less likely to have caramelization on any product that you want. So. All right, we got another question here. Uh, I imagine this is coming from Carol and I'm kind of imagining like you've got a huge Seder, you're cooking matzo balls for a lot of people. You have to start cooking them in different batches. Uh, so if that's the case, how long do you leave each bas uh, batch to rest in broth before starting the next batch? So if you have the space, what I would do is kind of like what I did here with a couple different pots. Um, if you, you know, and also making your matzo balls a little bit smaller, they will cook faster and rest less. So if you make a big, huge matzo ball, it's gonna take longer to cook and you're gonna need to let it rest longer. So if you make a smaller ones, you know, you can cook them, they'll cook in like maybe 10 minutes and then they maybe like resting like, you know, five, 10 minutes, that would be fine. And I always, again, I would rest them in some, I would hold them in something flat. Um, with some stock on them. So for cooking in large groups, I think smaller matzo balls are definitely a way to go. Plus then everybody gets like three matzo balls instead of one big matzo ball and, you know. So I, I would do that. Um, yeah. I will be making matzo balls for the temple Seder here. And I think we're planning, I don't know, maybe 30, maybe more. Um, if you live near Paducah, you can come and join us. You got anything else? Oh yeah, this is a fun one. Okay, you're planning a party, Seder. You've got one open seat left. Who do you invite, Padma, Gail, or Tom? Oh, well, I think I go with Gail because she is a Jew. Um, you know, you gotta you gotta go with Gail. I mean, I so I'll give you like a little behind the scenes on the judges. Um, Tom is so wonderful and he really takes every chef to heart and the feedback that he gives is really like he really wants to see everyone on the show improve and do well like there's just there's I don't think any of them have a like a mean or negative bone in their body um Gail oh my god she is just like she's like candy she's so sweet and she's so eloquent and like the way she describes food and talks about food, you could just tell she loves it. And um, I would, I think I'd love to have her at my Seder. And Padma, Padma is, I mean, it's um, so impressive to see how much she knows about food. Like she's literally written an encyclopedia on spices. Um, I would, you know, if I had Padma, I would love to do like a twist and do like a Indian curry matzo ball. Cause you could totally do that. You could twist these matzo balls any way you want. Yeah, I'd go with Gail. Plus she's like, you know, but then Tom's wife is Jewish, so he makes matzo balls all the time. I mean, it's all intertwined there, so. When I'm bored, I just take a bite of the matzo ball. Okay, while you're doing that, I just want to remind everybody that we have time for more questions. If you have Top Chef related questions, those can be about anything that's already aired, already that's already been shown or televised. Those questions are okay. Uh, out of bounds would be anything about something that has not yet aired. 
So while we wait for some more questions in the chat, uh, I just, and uh, we've got a few other queued up here. I just want to head back and share my screen. So bear with me, folks, while I move Sarah off the screen for a moment, just to mention that we have uh, our next event in our virtual series coming up next month. And that's going to be uh, about, as you can see here on the slide, talking to our kids about pride and being Jewish in the face of rising anti-Semitism. And we're really lucky to have some fantastic Camp Ben Frankel alumni like Sarah. Uh, this next event is going to be moderated and hosted by Peter Mayer, another alum of Camp Ben Frankel. And Peter was the White House correspondent for CBS News for decades. Um, and he's a veteran broadcast journalist, and he'll be moderating a panel discussion with some great speakers uh, to talk to parents and grandparents uh, about what it's like to help raise kids in, in these current times. Um, so that's a, like this. That event's free. It's on Zoom, and it's open to anyone who wants to RSVP. I'll make sure that that RSVP link gets put into the chat. And also, um, if you're interested in the recipes shown by, or the recipe shown by Sarah tonight, we'll be sending that out via email tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Um, and by the way, if you happen to know someone who might be interested in camp, if you are the parent of a potential camper at our camp, or if you just like to learn more, we are hosting a series of online <coughs> info sessions, virtual info sessions that are gonna be uh, hosted over the next few weeks. The next one's going to be a week from today at this very same time. So Wednesday, the 29th at the same time, 6 p.m. Central. You can meet me and our assistant director, Sarah, and we'll tell you all about camp. Uh, and uh, we'll show you pictures and videos and so on. It's a great way to get to know our camp. Kids come from more than 25 states to Camp Ben Frankel. Pretty cool. Uh, there's no limits as long as uh, campers are willing to travel and we'll pick them up at the airport or meet them at the bus in St. Louis or Chicago. Anyway, um, one other thing I wanna mention here is uh, we're, we're a small camp. And Sarah grew up at camp. Uh, and like Sarah, there's a lot of other kids from small communities that come to our camp. There's a lot of kids who are in need of a welcoming Jewish environment. And we're a nonprofit. We have a scholarship fund. If you might be interested in helping to uh, to ensure that a kid can come to camp and that's, that funds are available. Donations are certainly welcome. And we'll put the link there in the chat too. Any donations made are fully tax deductible. We are uh, a nonprofit charity and, um, and those donations will go to our scholarship fund. So again, the link's in the chat. Um, oops, I forgot to advance to the next slide. And this was what I was supposed to do. Whoops, anyway, there's the information on those info sessions. Okay. Anyway, I will now stop that screen share and we'll throw it back on over to, oh, I'm looking at my notes. There was something else I was about, supposed to say. I'm so sorry. One last thing. Sorry, folks, <laughs> which is we're currently booking presentations about Camp and Frankel to synagogues, Jewish day schools, Hebrew schools, or any other uh, Jewish community groups. So if you happen to know someone that might uh, be more interested in having us come and present about camp, just let us know uh, our contact information. You can find it also in the chat or, um, uh, or just reach out to us. And that's my final little item on my checklist here. Let's get back to the top chef, matzo ball, Sarah Bradley stuff. <laughs> and uh, we've got some questions here queued up. One of those uh, actually was a question suggested by um, Sarah Bradley. And that question <laughs> is, <laughs> um, actually, you were sharing a really fun story about what it was like as a Jewish contestant in uh, being on Top Chef and auditioning. You want to, could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is, um, so the audition process to get on the show, and this happened when I was, you know, waiting for, um, you know, I was waiting for, they're trying to get on season 16. And they fly out to LA, you need to meet with all the producers. They want to make sure you like them, they like you, all of that stuff. And so I walk into this big room and I sit down 
and I'm like, hey, everybody, you know, hey, y'all, and they're all like, okay, you know, this kind of like loud girl comes in, and just, you know, and it's, we got any Jews in the room, and they were like, they all looked at me like dead eye, and I was like, I just want to tell y'all happy Passover, because it was on Passover, Passover in 2018, so that's how long this journey has been going on. They're like, that's a very everybody, had, you know, happy Passover. And they're like, wait, and I was like, I'm a Jewish girl from Paducah, Kentucky. <laughs> like, I gave them my whole story. And I remember walking, like, then all of their faces lit up. And I remember walking out of the room thinking, like, I nailed it. I think I got the job. Um, so that was, like, my my funny, like, they weren't really sure what I was going to say. But then, you know, here I hit them with that. Um, I do think my favorite Jewish I, not even, and I saw this come up in the questions, not my favorite Jewish moment, but just my favorite moment of Top Chef from the last season, because I'm not going to give anything away about the new season, but from the last season is whenever I came around the steps, I was in Macau, China, and I got up to the top of the steps and my mother was there. And no clue. My first question was like, who's watching the restaurant? Because she did not tell me she was coming. And I got to run around Macau, China with my mother and figure out how to make matzo ball soup with not a single piece of matzo or ingredient that I knew what was going on with. And I won the challenge. And for me, that was just, it was just wonderful. It was just, it's one of my proudest Top Chef moments that I have. Um, oh. Okay, oh, I've got a question from, from Melanie. Oh, she asks, which other contestants' food would you most want to eat? Um, let's see. From the last season, I love Eddie Conrad's food. It was always so beautiful and so delicious. Um, from this new season, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that one. I mean, I will say this. On episodes like the first episode where we all had um, like very composed plates, we don't really get to try each other's whole dish all together because we're all going up like, you know, so three people serve and then three people serve or however that goes down. But on ones like the last episode where we were wandering around and we, you know, we did the rice and we we're kind of cooking outside once it was over, we got to wander around and eat everybody's food. And I will say that uh, Dale's kanji was delicious um but by far ali his um lamb uzi as i think how you say it was so good charbel's was also really delicious but the, ali's dish was was the best one there i mean i thought mine was pretty delicious too but uh and i think that they liked it but you know maybe this wasn't the best one okay i know we're at time but this i've got to ask this one last question it's, uh, I think it's a really wonderful question, which is uh, praise for your inspirational post. Um, the challenges of motherhood and having a, a big job uh, are, I think, resonate with a lot of people. And any words of advice for what it's like or, in a, or just how to, how, to be, how to succeed and as a working mom? Um, you know, that post was specifically talking about me continuing to pump and shipped milk home to my nine month old daughter while I was uh, overseas. And, um, you know, before I became a mother, I think that my mentality on how um, and what is expected of employees and employers um, was totally different. Um, I also think that that changed a lot with COVID. Uh, you know, in, in this industry, it didn't matter how sick you were, you were supposed to be at work or at least that's what I thought. But then, you know, COVID happened and family happened and I realized that life happens. And um, I kind of just, you know, with speaking with my husband and just deciding who I wanted to be as a mother, I decided that um, I wasn't gonna make people decide between life happening and their job happening. And so it's been really important to me to show that you can be a pumping, breastfeeding, working chef, um, in an industry that doesn't have, you know, what we call banker hours, like I don't have a nine to five, you know, um, I can do all of that and still have an amazing quality of life. So that it's important for me to show that there can be a work-life balance because for so long in my career, I didn't think that I was going to ever get that. And after moving home to Paducah, I realized I could. And now 
I mean, it's, it's becoming a mother has changed me to my core. And so now, you know, I, I think of every single employee in a completely different light. Um, I think of every person I work with completely different, every purveyor, everyone, everyone around me. I also think of my parents and what I put them through in a completely different light. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really great. And, um, know that if you are pumping or um, breastfeeding mother or formula feeding, any of those things, there is a lot of support out there for you if you uh, want to work in this industry and there wasn't until recently. So we are here for you. All right. And with that, I think we're just a little over. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And Chag uh, Sameach, everybody have a wonderful upcoming Pesach. And take care. So glad that you could join us tonight. Yes. Thanks. Did you kill it yet, Aaron? Don't <laughs> kill it yet. I was just thinking to tell you guys that people pay a lot of money to take these classes. And this one was free. And if you want to make a small little donation to Camp and Frankel, I would love that. It would help share an experience with a child like I had growing up. Um, watch me tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Central, 9 Eastern. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Thanks, Bradley. Bye, y'all.